So, I mean, if you look at Swiggy, right? Swiggy takes a cut in every deal you, any every order you make on the platform. So, I mean, you you can have that. You can also have like paid placements on the app. So, I mean, a company might sign a deal that, that hey, I mean, you as a restaurant, I'm going to show you more often, uh, and I think like I'm going to charge differently for you. So, I can have a different deal. I can maybe for every order I used to take like fifty. Uh, Or one rupees, but now for your order, I'm going to take like one fifty, but then I'm going to show you more often, right? So, but then the the change, right? I mean, I'm going to only charge that additional for the new increment I bring. So it's like, hey, I mean, the restaurant said, hey, I mean, I was I was only paying you one rupees per order, and I was getting hundred orders. Now you're charging me one and a half rupees, and I'm only getting hundred and ten orders. Now it's a loss making deal for me, right? So then they care about attribution. That are you bringing? I'm paying you twenty. Be more, but then are you bringing me more additional exposure or not? So I think that attribution is a problem which we kind of tackle there. Long story short, ads, strategic paid partnerships, live gifting. Gifting is pretty big on some of these shared current merge. A live commerce is something which a lot of our companies exploring. That I mean, I'm I'm dealing. I'm here. You know, maybe there's a short video going on, and this is a nice piece. Here is a link to this gadget. You can buy it on Flipkart, and the platform takes a cut. So I think there's like multiple levers of life. Life commerce is something which I think is pretty big in China, uh, and I think starting to shape up in India as well. The paid partnerships you see there, I think like these are brand endorsement deals, right? I mean the brand is, I mean Adidas could come in and do that, and I think like the platform would, I mean depending on the business models they have, the partnerships they have. So they would get a share of that, but there is like there is incentive for the platform to give more money to the creators because it's just healthier for the platform. A couple of things got mentioned in the chat. I just wanted to bubble it up to everybody. I mean, one of the things was like I mean, recommendations is not just about recommending items. If you look at Netflix, artwork personalization happens, right? If you go to Netflix homepage, I mean, we have it here, right? Somewhere. Yeah, I mean. I mean, for even for the same image, right? I mean, you you get seen a different image, I get shown a different image. So there's personalization there happening. Uh, what okay. the image is, what the text is, all of that uh, is personalized. It's not just about this. It's also about like how many ads do I show, where do I show this ad? If you look at YouTube, right? I mean, YouTube will identify. Hey, there is a very critical moment in this video now, which is going to strategically place ad just before that, right? So I mean, we do that. One of my team members, Madhun Mehtesh, they've been working on a bandit model for ad slots. It's like, how many ads should I show that? Uh, and uh, should I show an ad? Where do I show this ad? Right? I mean, like, I have this feed, I have this content. Uh, now, should I show this ad after two or three videos or five videos? There, I start making predictions. That is the user going to stay on my platform? Like, what's the session length going to be? The user is going to stay longer. Maybe I don't need to cram the ads in the first five. I can wait a while. Or if the user is going to abandon, then maybe I have to. I should not show an ad. I should show an ad. How do I deal with that? I mean, if you look at the ranker, right? Maybe the ranker has very opinions, right? That the first item is score a point eight five. The second item is score a point eight two. The third item is score a point six five. Suddenly, we know that hey, there's a drop in the quality of content I have, going from point eight five eight two and then six five. So then, like the user may not like it, they might go away. So let me show an ad there. So I think now. Is this a recommendation problem? Is this not a recommendation problem? All of these are applied machine learning problems, right? So, for all intents and purposes, like all of this, we consider as like recommendation problems. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. I think that's an excellent point. I think like one of the things which is which is very important to understand and appreciate in this is the feedback loops. So we have. I mean, it's very very important to have very uh, real time feedback loops. The feedback loop will tell us how a content is performing, and then mature it to the next level of propulsion on the platform. So here's an example. Uh, 
every content, right? Every short video uploaded on TikTok, right? Will get a minimum of X views, right? I mean, again, I cannot disclose whether we do that on shared chat or not, but then a lot of these companies, I mean, all of this content will need to get surface to a few users, right? Because look, my, my candidate generators and all that, I need to learn these embeddings for this content. If I have to learn embeddings, I'll have to show it to a minimum 100, 200, some users, get to know how it's performing, get that feedback. If it's performing well, then maybe I should show it to the next set of users, right? If not, then maybe the organically, the post is not receiving good engagement, it'll die down automatically, right? So what's the shelf life of a content? Uh, is it is it is it past its peak like Mother's Day, Father's Day, right? I mean, it kind of goes active the next day. You, it's not that you stop caring about your parents, but at least you stop posting about that content, right? So shelf life of some of these event-driven, festive-driven content is they organically die in a day or two. But other contents don't, right? I mean, they are still active. There's still a lot of people who view it. So I think long short answer is feedback loops. The long answer is that th there is shelf life prediction algorithms at play. Uh, and uh, I think like people do look at what's the success rate in the last six hours versus in the last one day. And then you can see some delta is if, if there's a decline, is it already reached a peak or is the success rate declining and all? So I think a lot of these like calculations go on behind the scene. So one of the things which is worth mentioning, right? I mean, the way at least my team is organized, we have a dedicated group of people looking at the post life cycle itself. That's literally called the post life cycle team. That what's the life cycle of the post? Can I give it the minimum number of views? How does it sustain later on? And uh, what, what's the trajectory of a post in platform? So all these problems are tackled. In. It is right. I mean, so again, like it's not it's not manual, no. I mean, like it's all the content has. I, I, it's yeah. The question is like, isn't it difficult for all the content? I mean, it is. That's why I'm I'm kind of I'm making it sound that hey, it's an important and hard problem. That's why you're here in the course studying how to solve it. But I think like we're not doing a custom thing for a post, right? I think we are developing these frameworks, these models, every <coughs> post, all the posts, right? I mean, like millions of posts get, since I started, like a million posts would have gotten, gotten created on the platform, right? I mean, so all of them have gone through that initial stage. They've gotten those initial hundred views. They've gotten some feedbacks. In about a couple of years, couple of hours from now, they will get trained on another model. The model will learn online. So all of that is like automated. So they're gonna go through that. No. Yes, no. excellent, right? So this is, this, is, this is a brilliant question. This is what I want my team to think about as well, right? Uh, so, I mean, the question is great that, hey, I mean, if new content, new users coming in, then what about, like you said that there's gonna be a node in this graph. So is your graph different now? So one of the discussions I'm having with a few people across industries is, I mean, it's easy for me to think about, again, I agree, right? I don't have a solution to your question uh, because I'm still finding my way through it. Like, is it, is it gonna work for us or not? Let's think about this together for a minute. If you look at Spotify, Netflix, right? The content space is more or less stable. New content gets added daily, but then it's not like a bulk, right? It's maybe like half a percent of the entire. On share chat, mod, Instagram, like 50% content in this week is not, was not there last week. So the stability of the content space is great on Netflix and Spotify. The stability in short videos is not great. On Pins, Pinterest as well, like, I mean, it's not like every hour, every day there's new content. So in these stable content spaces, this node generation problem is less of a problem. So then that means like maybe graph-based approaches are better there. Uh, for us, it's slightly harder, right? I mean, I think it's still valuable for us to do that, but then like the complexity for us is slightly more. So that's one. The other thing is, right, if you look at the candidate generation model here. This model here, right? I mean, in this model, I mean, if I have, once I have this model trained, I mean, look, this is a great point to mention. Like, in GNNs, right, one of the things, if you read the Pinsage paper, they look at local neighborhood. I don't have to train the entire graph model again. What, essentially, what they end up doing is, like, they look at the, in, what is a graph? Graph is how you're connected. Right? So you're connected to some nodes, some, some, some movies, some artists, some actors and all. Now, I, if I have a graph, which is already learned, now to add a new node, I don't have to retrain the entire graph. They'll give me an aggregation function. Tell me the local neighborhoods. I can give you the embedding of this particular node without you having to retrain the entire graph. This is what I meant by inductive. I mentioned this term half an hour ago and I said, I'm not gonna talk about it. Thanks for bringing this up. But essentially what's happening is that these models are inductive. I don't have to retrain them. I can get additional, get information for new content by just leveraging the current graph itself 
because the way they operate i don't have a whatever way to draw it but if you know that this new content is going to get connected to these nodes then you have the local neighborhood defined and jnn will give you that local neighborhood aggregation function you pass in through that and then you get the embedding for this exactly similar stuff happens here i have this neural network trained i have a new content i don't have to retrain this model it's, it's already there the neural network weights are already learned as long as i have the initial features right i mean the initial features here the initial features here as long as i am able to kick start this neural inference process with these features i can get the embedding from the from the post tower automatically right and that i can use so these are all inductive approaches so that's why like we we prefer this because i don't want to deal with like retraining all these models again and again and again it's not a biggest yeah i think like that depends on how you define the nodes i mean the users may be stable the content may or may not be also i mean again one of the things on on share chat right we have tags so whenever you upload a video you tag it like ipl 2022 or like maybe mothers day or like romantic chai you know so the tag space is big so you can have i mean what are your nodes the so nodes could be the post or the nodes could be one level above it could be one level less granular it could be the tag space so i think how you define the node space there is how you solve it but i think like we we don't know whether this will work for very very real time content or not right yes i mean this is where like i mean local neighborhood and all that kind of comes in but again i think the usefulness of approaches like gnns for fresh content right i mean there is no paper yet at least i'm not aware of that yet so i think like if if we are interested in this problem uh, again given additional head counts approvals from my cfo i will hire people and like start looking at this problem Hi. like jnn and the and the demand who somebody is at least appreciating it online so yeah uh the, so the question is like i mean if i have additional information about the user like the user age and other stuff demographic information does it impact the recommendation and the neighborhood aspects right i'll answer it in two parts here right i mean if i have additional i mean i think if we look at the youtube right i mean if if we have additional of these like user features where is the user tower uh, there is a user features there past watches and all right so the moment i mean this model the moment you have some of these here or you have some of these here like geo language topics right so the moment you have this the embedding coming out of this is automatically adjusting for that so that's one in the jnn case which we haven't talked about in slides i think like you can use that to define how you find the neighborhood so i think like i mean how you still have to specify there is a graph you have a new node where in this graph will this new node lie so that is up to you that is up for us to design right there you can encode that hey i think i'm going to link form an edge between this node and all the users who are in the same age now this is where you are actually introducing the bias to the system right because this is a bias which which will either give you the wins or hurt you because if you think that this is great for recommendation then adding that structural domain information is useful otherwise you are just adding noise to the to the graph right because again like you can connect make a lot of connections it's just going to pollute your neighborhood pollute your embeddings right so this is where i think like a lot of yeah a lot of like insights go into how do we actually like decide the neighborhood how i mean what are the nodes in the graph so there's a lot of like domain information i mean this is what like good ml scientists should be doing right applied scientists that hey look i mean you can write an icml paper for a great graph network uh, inference local neighborhood but then like how do you use that to actually solve your problem it does not require a lot of like nuanced thinking sure there is one other question in chat what is the question in chat yes this is a question from rohit kumar all capitals uh, sir how music recommendations will work for broadcast channels on tv what will the parameters of like near players like this this is a great question uh, it's an excellent question i have never faced this question before uh, how does recommendation work for broadcast channels on tvs i have no clue i mean uh, maybe somebody has a better answer i mean right 
right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, yes. So one, one answer from the cloud is that maybe it's like curated handpicked. I think I have a good example. When I was preparing for my JEs, right? We had this love guru, love guru on radio. How many of you remember that? Do you? No, nobody. Cool. I mean, like, yeah, Friday evenings, right? It was like this love guru on, on, on Radio City. And uh, it's kind of talking about some, some of those nuances of that time and recommending music accordingly. So I think like, I think there is a lot of like heavy hand curation. I think this is what the editors, right? If you look at news, right? One of the questions here is also not just TV, but news articles, right? Which news articles get published on Times of India? If you look at Times of India right now, I mean, not Times of India, New York Times right now, right? They do have like data scientists looking at some of these personalization and they're looking at like cookies and each cookie has your interest and then we can match that. But the newspaper cannot do that in print, right? So then you have these editors. The editors are literally signing off. This news gets included, this doesn't. And there's a lot of like political sway in that, which is that you, you, you let a news article pass, somebody higher up is gonna come back, knock on your door, why the hell did you do that? So I think there's a lot of that at play. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. Yes. Yes, excellent. I think the question is, and this is a very brilliant point. I think like outdated content, right? So I, I, one of the one of the problems which even we on ShareChat are tackling is like this post life cycle. I've talked about post initialization that hey, once I have a new post, I will show it to a minimum X users, uh, and then get the embedding, right? But then like, how do I know that the post has lived its life? I might still be recommending. Like I mean, right now there is a lot of like Father's Day, Mother's Day posts which still get shown one or two days after, right? And I think like what happens there, I. Right now, what happens there is like the feedback loop is not fast enough. You start showing some people are still okay with it. You start seeing a delta in performance, right? The engagement will go down. The engagement at the peak of the post, when it was very timely, it will be very high. But then if you start looking at the engagement in the six hour, six hour, four hour, four hour buckets, right? You start seeing a dropping trend. The moment you see a dropping trend, then the model will start realizing that, hey, it's not good enough. The question then becomes, is that fast enough for us? If there is a if there is a debt to a post, right? Can I short circuit that? If I know it's gonna trail and like slowly die down, can I just reduce it right now and save the X amount of traffic exposure and, and distribute it to others? So that's where, which is a problem which my team is investigating right now. now. Again, we don't have good solutions. If you have good solutions, come work with us, do an internship, solve these problems, we write cool papers, deploy good stuff. So in, in, I mean, this is like, I mean, the post life cycle is everything, right? It's from the start to the debt and uh, and again, it's very subjective. I mean, Mother's Day, Father's Day are easy for me to target, but Wimbledon results, right? IPL results. I mean, IPL is a great example. Like the IPL, I mean, literally it goes on for a month, right? And yesterday's results are not relevant today. Today's results are relevant, right? So even in the same topic, same tag, you have content which is very fresh, you have not fresh content. How do you deal with that? If you have great solutions, come work with us, solve it for us, please, as well. Everything, no? I mean, like everything is stored. I mean, we're gonna talk about some more. I mean, you, you'll be surprised at what, what, what's getting stored. I was surprised when, I mean, this is not a clickbaity title. You'll be surprised by what comes next, <laughs> but there's a ton of information getting stored. I mean, getting stored, e everything. I mean, everything is getting logged. If not, then like everything should be getting logged. So, yeah. Yes, Ex excellent question, right? I mean, I mean, these are these are the questions which the post life cycle team are thinking about. Some of them they should be thinking about. So if you're listening in, hey, I mean, these people are thinking about it. So maybe you should do a better job there. Uh, no, but great point, right? I think like one of the things which we have in the system is like real time performance. So the features, right? I mean, look, I mean, I, I, hand wavily we talked about the features, but if you zoom in, some of these features are like real time performance. What's been happening in the last four hours, last twenty four hours? last seven days, last 28 days, last six months, right? So the feature is not just about what's your overall interaction engagement, but what's like recent. So this is why like you need a lot of feature engineering, which is very real time. 24 hour features are not as useful. Four hour features are useful. We retrain, we retrain our models every four hours. In session personalization, four hours is like infinity, right? I mean, that's too, too long. 
I need like 20 second response times. If you interact with something in last 20 seconds, then at least I need that information so that I can make a better inference right now, right? So I think the latency requirements and the real time aspect here is like very, very critical, especially on real time platforms. On movies, maybe not so much. Why? Because your, 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 your preferences and the content space are not gonna change. Spotify is somewhere in between, but closer towards the movie front because the real time aspect is not as, as dynamic there. So the features are very real time. Yes, cool. I mean, I, I really, I mean, look, I mean, I, 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 I'm almost on the brinks of showing you the presentation from internally, right? I mean, like in another tab in the same laptop, there are presentations wherein we are, we are thinking about exactly the same problems. I'll tell you what the problem is, right? Look, there is a lot of content, right? I mean, as you mentioned, right? There's a six month old content, which is great popping up now, but look, I mean, the candidate generation, we are literally talking about candidate generator here, right? Now the content space is a million, 100 million, right? Now in a month, I have 100 million posts. In six months, I have 600 million posts. I'm okay with 100 million. So that's the current system. We literally, I'm hoping I'm allowed to say this. If not, it's fine. Uh, we deployed look back period. Shirijan and a lot of people on the team, right? Literally like three weeks ago, we increased the look back period on ShareChat from 14 days to a month. Now suddenly if I have, Post from a month back, I am bringing back from the dead, right? Zombie posts. That these posts have had embeddings one month ago. Now I'm bringing them back alive on the system. Problem is, do I have updated representations for them? It's going to compete with the new post. Now, this is where a lot of interesting problems come up. Look, in the new post, we don't know enough. Why? Because not enough users have seen it. So they're going to have bad embeddings. The old posts have had a lot of interactions. So have, they have good embeddings, right? So then, like, I have good understanding of my old post but I don't have recent interactions. A lot of the models are depending on recent interactions. Now the new posts are getting a lot of recent interactions. So now you have this weird dynamic that old posts, they're high quality, but then they don't have recent interactions. So the model is not able to learn, but then the new posts have crap understanding, but then interactions. So this is where content understanding and user behavior go hand in hand. Now it is our job to make it better. This is not enough. This is what we deployed. We got good gains and these gains are going to trickle in. Look, very importantly, right? You have increased supply here. One of the things which is very underappreciated, which I don't think like, even when I say this, you won't understand the depth of it is when I increase the look back period to a month, I have doubled the supply. So the entire space of what was available to you is now double, right? Now, again, it's not something which you asked for, right? I mean, it was a system requirement from RN that I, I couldn't load 600 million posts. So I was just doing a million, like 100 million posts or whatever. And then I had a one month period. So it was an obvious system design reason, I mean, ideally you could have infinite look back period, but we can't from a system design perspective. So people end up doing a one month long threshold. Now, one of the things we are tackling, we're gonna discuss next week is, I want infinite look back. If I have infinite look back, then I need to scale my systems. And I need a way to bring them back from the dead, right? Which is like embeddings. The embeddings are not comparable. Now the embedding models are also retrained, right? It's very important to understand they are, they are not retrained, they're incrementally trained. The, the difference is if you retrain a model, you're throwing away the previous data, you're throwing away and retraining from scratch. The embedding space, the weights are all gonna be very different. Incremental training says that, hey, I have a model, I'm not gonna throw that away. I have additional data, I'm gonna train it on that additional data as well, right? So then historically, if you have this one month long period and you're retraining every day, then that means the training data from one month ago is still there in the model. You haven't thrown it away. You've just, maybe it's reduced. Why? Because you've had a lot of recent interactions which have retrained your models, right? So the question then becomes, I'm literally, all, these are all the problems which my team is literally working on right now, which is if you incrementally train a model 30 times, the initial model embedding and the final model embedding, is that a huge drift in the distribution? And if it is, then the embedding I have for a six month old content is not comparable with the embedding I have for today's content. Then I'll have to re do something else. Maybe I'll simulate interactions from today and feed it to the model, do something. I don't know what the solution is. Yes, yes, yes. 
it still makes it still makes right and we have and we have a we have to de design a model to solve that in the embedding space sure i mean like how i, I don't know how we are going to do that right so i think i think there's a great intuition here i think one of the things which i do want to look at i don't know how it again very easy for me to say in english very hard for actually any of us to do this right so but great ideas i i love the thought process here i think like you you want to be able to predict what would happen right i think let's let's zoom in for the like new post like post life cycle let's focus on new post now you know when when i have enough let's say 1000 interactions i have a very stable embedding of content right but when i have five interactions zero interactions three interactions not so much can i develop a model which is going to mimic what the 1000 interaction embedding might look like so you have a content and signing vector like nothing of behavior just understanding like yolo resnet anything right any content semantic understanding model which gives you what is this image about and then you start supplementing it with some behavior interaction the goal is predict what a 1000 interaction embedding might look like now this is theoretically a nice paper to write but i don't know how well it's going to work why because you're developing model to predict an embedding this embedding will be used by another model to make a prediction which will be used by the user right so there's a long feedback loop i will do this right at this at this stage right now i mean so there there is a very nice paper which is very very similar to this which is exactly what we are kind of consuming right now and trying to we we have a way we have an architecture to improve on this it's going to take a while i think the internet here is pretty fast internet is fast maybe the this this archive thing is slow i'm going to come back to this one see real time internet is pretty fast good job university Yeah, I mean, I, I'll come back. Maybe it'll load in a second. But essentially, right? I mean, like, how can I can I mimic? Can I predict the future embedding in a time series? I don't know how it's going to work because you have to. I mean, the embedding space is sacrosanct, right? I mean, you have to. You cannot destroy the embedding space. So, how do you maintain the embedding space to be able to have the all the posts, new, old, in the same space? That's like hard, not not trivial. There's a question. Yeah, I mean, so group group wise, I'll only do when I cannot do it on a user level basis, right? I, if I can do it on a user level basis, why do I remove that information? So that computation is fine. I think, I mean, yes, I mean, if you're starting from scratch, if you don't have any of any of these setup, then yes, group wise makes sense. But if you already have enough computation to do this personalized user candidate generation, then like I think going group level is a step back uh, in progress. But I think like if you want to start, let's, I mean. I think the first solution you should have is like no personalization at all, not even group wise. Just generate candidates, pass it to the ranker. Uh, then you should look at like group wise, maybe like maybe identify user groups and do some personalization, then find like user wise, and then user wise real time. I think that that paper should have loaded now. Yes. So this is a paper at Sigaya 2021, right? I mean, literally last year, which is looking at uh, sorry, yeah, learning to warm up cold item embeddings for cold start recommendations. So this is like I mean I have cold start uh, and then I'll have a view how can I, how I can warm up this embedding the the post life cycle work I was talking about right that do I have these embeddings how do I once I have hundred interactions on it I'll think they'll be a lot more trustworthy but the initial one will be slightly not so how do we do that so there are people looking at this problem we also have a if Pushkar is on the call hey people are talking about a project we are supposed to complete so yeah so I mean. Uh, again like this i'm not going to talk about this in detail essentially but you have a lot of like cold items you have some cold item embeddings and then you can maybe some add some warm up embeddings and then train it end to end on interactions so this is where like i mean it's all like a play on neural networks so if you know the building blocks of neural networks look you have great ideas in here right literally in the last 5 7 minutes you guys have talked about at least two or three good papers i mean at least a couple of short papers so say are one good full paper potentially right I think the intuitions are there. Why? Because you understand the product, you understand the nuances. Look, you need the math to formulate it as a solution. This is this is why this 
I mean, the entire academics around this is needed, right? I think it, there are at least two good paper ideas over here, but it all depends on execution, right? I mean, are you able to formulate that? You can say that, oh, I can do this, right? You talked about the time series prediction thing, right? I mean, can you have a regularizer which can ensure that when you're doing this over a period of time, the, the, the embedding space is kind of uh, maintained in that, I mean, whatever. The, I mean, look, I mean, I, I, I high level by the idea, right? But I don't think anybody has done the evaluation of what's the H1 from the LSTM one output to H10. Are they in the same space? Are they comparable? Are they not, right? If they're not in the same space or if they're not having the properties, why? Because again, you're not just using it for a subsequent prediction. You're using it in a model, which is trained on this embedding space, right? So there is a, there's a dependent model relying on you. If you start destroying the initial thing, then like it, everything becomes noisy, right? So maybe it is, maybe it's not. But the question then becomes, have the LSTM people done that evaluation that the output of H1 to H10, is it in the same space or not? How do we even evaluate that? I don't know. Like, how do you know that it's, gonna, it's in the same space? How do you know that two vectors are from the same space or not? I mean, I think like there is some vector algebra which could give you that. I'm not aware of that. User what? Yeah, I mean, so I think like, yeah, so um, most of these are unsupervised, right? I mean, like if I, I mean, not this, these are supervised, but then like content understanding, like if I, ResNet architectures are like traditional image architectures, like object detection and all that. So they tell us like, what are the, what is this embedding? What is this content about? What is this image about? So I think like a lot of image and video understanding, right? I mean, these are uh, based on unsupervised approaches, auto encoders or whatever, like self-supervision self included. So a lot of the like, content understanding of images and videos. Sorry? Yes, exactly. Yes, great point, right? I mean, like, especially in a warm, -up, warm scenario case, I think like one of the key projects in our team is like, how can I use content understanding to augment the behavioral vectors we have? So, I mean, look, the, these are the problems which we attack. I mean, literally, I mean, I, I cannot share that internal slide, but these are the discussions which we are having internally. And I think like we got to move on, right? I mean, we are also, I'm just at the candidate generator. I cannot spend the entire session on this. But I'm glad, I think like, I, I think it's really impressive, right? The, the, the ideas at least which are in the room, right? I think like there's great research potential there. So let me take, take a step back, like what's happening? Where are we? We're, we're talking about like candidate generators and now I want to talk about rankers. So we haven't gotten even to the meat, right? And I had distilled a lot from the meat as well. So I don't think we're gonna get entire coverage here. Cool, so we're gonna talk about three things here. One is like multitask models. Uh, the other one is contextual bandits. And the third thing is going to be multi-objective models. Now, this is where there's a trade-off, right? You get a lot of inside the company gossip from me in the last one hour at the cost of some depth in the coming slides. Because I, I think like I selfishly would really want to optimize for coverage here and not for uh, depth on any of these topics because I don't think this is a... Look, I mean, I don't think you have enough nuances, enough preferences in your research career to know that, hey, I really want to understand depth. I think I'll, I bring a lot of value to tell you about the space so that you can have a more focused discussion. The slides, the papers, everything is going to be there. So if you think I was talking fast up until now, see me in the next one hour and see me rushing through the slides now. Cool, multitask learning. Uh, so again, the multitask learning setup is very simple. I have an input. Again, nothing about recommendations. I have an input. I have a shared bottom. I have two tasks and I can learn these models together, right? So I have the same input, I make two predictions, I have a loss from up output one, I have a loss from output two, I back propagate back. Now the shared bottom is learned on both the sides. The tower A and tower B are learned only on the losses on output A and output B. So that's what typical multitask learning looks like. What people said was that, hey, I want to use this for recommendations. Like, let me take a step back. Why multitask? Like I think like if you look at YouTube, if you look at share chat mods, right? I can predict whether the user is gonna like this video, whether the user is gonna comment on this video, on share chat, are you gonna share this video on your WhatsApp? Or are you gonna maybe stream the video entirely? So there is multiple predictions I can make. And based on each of these predictions, I can show a recommendation to you. So this is why instead of just predicting whether you're gonna like a video or not, I can make all these predictions. What's the probability of you liking it? What's the probability of commenting on it? What's the probability of you sharing it? What's the probability of you streaming it 80%, right? All of that I can do. 
and on, on music it's even further right what's the probability of you saving it to your playlist if it's a save that's a huge signal why because you're going to downstream consume it i'm not going to recommend that to you if you save a track you're going to automatically consume it from your playlist later on so save is a very great uh, future engagement signal right same for artist are you going to click on the artist and explore that page that means artist exposure so instead of making one prediction i can make multiple predictions that's why multitask models come in so it's a simple ml multitask model now but what people said was that hey let's let's do something right let's create multiple experts and each of the expert are going to look at some sort of engagement behaviors right so instead of a simple multitask model i can have a expert model and the expert is going to look at hey for for each of these outputs like probability of like probability of share i will have an expert vote now the the way this works in a neural network is via attention mechanisms by gating mechanisms so gating is a way in which you can decide like dynamically how much respect are you giving to a network 1 versus 2 versus 3 so again long story short you want more nuanced learning in your system and you want to have some experts maybe some experts are more focused on familiar music maybe some experts are focused on nostalgic music maybe some are focused on certain that to contain certain others you don't know that you're not encoding that you're just allowing the model to learn those nuances and then you're putting a to make one of the prediction you're saying that okay the gating mechanism tells me how much should i respect each of these experts so yeah so this assumption says that expert is able to learn different patterns and focus on different things right so so this this was good what actually was even further good was that instead of having a uh, same gating across all experts i can have an individual gating for each task if you look at the difference between second and third right in the second the gating mechanism of how you respect one versus the other expert is shared across a task in the third figure it's different right so here you're kind of almost learning a per task per sample weighing of the experts so this is a lot more nuanced learning right it will kind of increase the parameter space a lot but also gives you that richness of learning that now for each task i have a different view of my expert right for predicting likes is separate for predicting shares is separate right so again it it comes at a computational cost it comes at a parameter size cost but then it's adding more nuanced learning right so again if you look at the leftmost model it's very simple it's going to try to do something which is good for everybody but now you have dedicated resources on each of your tasks so that means like you're learning a lot more nuanced richer uh solutions yeah so again going on because uh, why not uh, so again this is this is a typical multitask setup right let me take a step back where are we and what's missing i have a, i have tens of hundreds of millions of content space i have a candidate generator that candidate generator gives me a few hundred a few thousand posts now i can have a multitask prediction model gives me like rank these thousands and i'll give us get a score and sort by that show to the user that completes the end to end cycle i have my recommendation system working i go home i enjoy my success and i retire with the money i have in my bank now the problem is that this has a lot of very bad feedback loops uh, which is filter bubbles why because look i mean if you like certain content right then the model is going to force you to show that content to you there is no exploration i'm doing if i just depend on this model right it learns that oh you know what this user likes videos from this creator from this topic it's just going to double down keep doubling down keep doubling down and just do that time and again right this is exactly the echo chambers we talk about in the society that just because you have one polarized view on a topic the model picks it up and puts it on steroids right i mean literally on a will drug you with that information why because there's a very self reinforced reinforcing feedback loop here this is bad and we should have systems which fix it which is where bandits come in right bandits is one class of models which solve this problem uh, there could be others you can solve this problem in other ways but the core of the bandits lie in this dilemma of exploration exploitation and let me quick raise of hands i don't expect any but how many of you, uh, you are aware of what bandits are at least how many of you have heard what a bandits word before not the bandit queen the indian bollywood movie but bandits raise of hands please one two 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 and a half three and and do you know what the bandit is like any 
I'll expect you might know something. Or maybe, see, this is a bias I have, right? I mean, you've been answering good questions. I thought, oh, you might know what Bandit is. Cool. So I think like, I mean, yeah, so, so I'm going to talk, let me see if I have a picture here. Yeah, I'm going to jump to this slide and then come back and talk uh, in general. So just focus on the top right figure, slot machines. You go to a casino, uh, and then you, you have these slot machines. And you pull an arm from a slot machine, it gives you a reward, right? I mean, you, you pull an arm, you get like $5. Let's say there are hundreds of these slot machines. You go to a casino, there are 100 machines, right? Now, you, let's say you try for a few. You, you go to the first machine, you pull an arm, you get $5, right? And you have a budget of doing such 10, 10 times this, right? Then you say, okay, the, for the second time, I'm going to go to the second machine. You pull an arm, you get a reward of $2. You go to the third time, you pull an arm. In the next one, you get a reward of $11. So what's the sequence? For the first machine, you got $5. Second, you got $2. Third, you got $11. The fourth time you come in, what are you going to do? Yeah, but then like, I mean, sure. I mean, you'll go try others, right? I mean, you want to pick up like, maybe slot machine 51 and pull that up. What else? Somebody else has some other strategies? What are you going to do? The first machine gave you $5. The second machine gave you $2. Third machine gave you $11. And you have hundreds of these. For the fourth time, what are you going to do? Yeah, so the nine machine is like maximize the reward, right? Like I, I, I know that this machine gives me $11, I'm gonna keep pulling it, right? And you on the, perfect. You are doing exploitation, right? You know that I'm getting this reward, I'm gonna exploit that knowledge. You are doing exploration. You observe that, hey, I, I saw $11, maybe there is a $25 machine somewhere, right? Maybe I'll try to do that exploration. So this is the typical exploration, exploitation trade-off, which these bandits allow you to do. So essentially the policy is that, hey, I know something about the user. I'm gonna exploit that knowledge and make recommendations based on that. But at the same time, for a certain number of cases, I'm gonna try to show some random stuff and then observe user feedback. I know that you've never interacted with like any of these political news or political videos. I'm gonna start showing that to you and see, did you like it? Did you not like it? If you liked it, then I know more about you. I learned that. And then I can, like, I, I have a better representation of you. If you do not like it, then I know that you would not like it, right? So this is a way to get rid of the filter bubble problems. So that's a high level of what a explore exploit means. Yeah, I think this is, this is great. I think like, I mean, the, the, the point he's making is that, hey, you can try this for 30% times and then like start exploiting there, right? So this is like a mix, like explore, exploit, but in the explore, you have an intelligent strategy, right? So this is where like Epsilon Greedy is a way of doing random exploration. Thompson sampling is doing some uncertainty of your exploration. Because if, it, if you're exploiting, right? I mean, if you're, sorry, if you're exploring, it's, I can randomly pick up content which you haven't liked, or I can make an inform that, okay, my model knows that you definitely do not like it, but oftentimes my model is uncertain. So I might just reduce uncertainty, right? If I know that you don't like it, then what's the point of me showing that to you, right? But the other cases, I don't know whether you might like a political news movie or something like that. So I can also do that for uncertainty reduction in my model. So where you explore, right? That could be very intelligent. So that's the point. You can either randomly do that or do that using some intelligence. And that's where a lot of like bandits community has spent a lot of time looking at Thompson sampling, looking at others to kind of uh, do that. So again, an entire area of machine learning dedicated to this. A great plugin, look, uh, Professor Ranunban here, right? I mean, comes from Yahoo. You, you, you cannot talk about bandits without acknowledging the role Yahoo Labs played in 2010, 2011 with the bandit setup. Yeah, I mean, I think it was one of the first companies which developed and deployed it at scale, the like Yahoo News banner ads, or maybe you can talk on the homepage. Right. So the homepage on Yahoo, right? I mean, the articles get shown over there. They were like, this is way back, right? And when we were all in our diapers, uh, essentially they're like, I mean, now, now to do this at scale, I mean, it's not just about writing academic papers, right? Doing it at scale in production traffic means that you're also learning counterfactually. Counterfactual evaluation was a paper written uh, back in 2010 by Lee Hong Lee, again at Yahoo. So, I mean, you look at PayPal Mafia. Have you, have you heard the term PayPal Mafia? 
Yeah, so all these like Elon Musk and like all these big people, right? From who were at PayPal before and then they started these companies, right? I personally view Yahoo Research from until from 2007 to 2012. Like That's the bell labs of the 1980s, 1990s. A lot of innovation there. A lot of, I mean, like, look, my manager at uh, Spotify, I mean, I, I grew tremendously working with her. Very proud to have been her mentee. Uh, Munia Lalmas, she was uh, head of research. I don't know if, yeah. So Munia was my manager at Spotify. So, I mean, a lot of the things I know, literally I owe it to her. So again, Yahoo Labs from that time is like the golden era. And you see a lot of people across different, different companies uh, starting to do a bunch of that. So it's only fair when we talk about bandits, we do acknowledge by Yahoo Labs. So. And we have an alumni from Yahoo Labs so, uh, in here. So I think like one of the things, right? I mean, like there, there are very few people who have transitioned and who know the flavor of both industry and academia, right? So I think like I, I, was, I, was, I was very vocal, right? And one of the core reasons I wanted to be here was so that I can give this presentation in front of Professor Renanban and start kind of pitching him, hey, we should be collaborating on some of these topics. Uh, so that's the personal background. But coming in, uh, when we start talking about bandits, let me give you an example of Spotify homepage. Netflix homepage, you start seeing these rectangles, right? Very similar here. If you look at Swiggy Zomato, you start seeing similar, similar rectangular boxes. Now, one of the ways in which uh, this is coming in from uh, Rex's paper we wrote uh, at, uh, in 2018, James is now at, at Rex's, uh, Ben is still at Spotify, Samantha is at LinkedIn, uh, Carl is at NVIDIA, he's at Spotify, he's still at Spotify, I'm at Shaker. So I think like the, the bunch of people you work with, they're going to start spreading across. So I think like when you collaborate, right? I mean, I'd rather have more authors in my paper than less because the, the community you develop and the interactions you have across the industry, it's kind of an inverted pyramid, right? I mean, like five years down the line, you'll have 10 people working at 10 different companies, you have good network. But coming back, I think I've done enough of non-tech uh, blabber. But essentially, if you start looking at the homepage, we have a shelf. Shelf is a horizontal collection and each shelf has a card. A card is a playlist. Now shelf has a shelf name, which is the explanation. So this is, the, this is why the title of the paper was Explore, Exploit, Explain. So explore, exploit on the bandit stuff and explain based on the explainability. Now we saw, again, I'm gonna cut short through a few things. We saw a huge impact of the explanations. People could relate a lot more to when they understood the explanation and they related to it. So each of these shelves has an explanation, right? I mean, your heavy rotation recently played or because you like this. So that explanation gives a trigger to what content to expect in that horizontal shelf. So essentially, if you start looking at it, right, you can decompose the homepage into rectangular grid. Now this becomes a whole page optimization problem. We haven't done it up until now, right? The only things which you have learned in this lecture so far is give me a user, give me an item, I'm gonna score that, right? You only have looked at a point-wise view. The whole page optimization view, this is how you construct the homepage, right? Again. There are other fancier ways and more elegant ways of doing it. This is just one of them. So, okay, how we, how we do that is like, okay, I, I'm gonna have a shelf and then I can place a few cards in the shelf. And then once I have these shelves, I can start ranking these shelves altogether. So that's a high level view. Let's zoom in on what happens. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna skip some of this and come back to this later. So essentially the way, the way you do this is like, I, I have this, this rectangular grid as my uh, real state. Now what I can do is I can select a playlist and then put it horizontally. So doing this horizontally gives me a way to create a horizontal shelf. Now I have these shelves created. What I can do is I can pick up one shelf and show it vertically and then go down, right? So essentially, if you, if you look, look at what's happening is if I have a way to select a playlist for a shelf, I can create a bunch of shelves separately. I can pick up a card, put it on the first, then pick up another card, put it in the second, go on, do that. So that'll give me a shelf. I can keep on creating these shelves. Once I, have, once I have it, then what I can do is I can try to order these shelves on my homepage. So now I'll pick up a shelf, show it to the user, and then go vertically. So doing it horizontally, doing it vertically gives you the entire grid. So that's a high level view. Now, how exactly are you picking it? This is where the bandits come into play. So how exactly are you deciding which card to pick is the output of the bandit model. Let me explain what's going on here. So bandits, I mean, the, 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 the solution we proposed was Bart. So Bart is a Simpsons character. The homepage team at Spotify loved Simpsons for some reason. I was okay, I mean, neutral about this name. But essentially, like, I mean, this is bandits for recommendations or treatments. 
uh, it has a bunch of properties. One is that there's a user preference model. This user preference model is any model which you have, which gives you a score of this user and an item. It could be a dot product. It could be the output of the two tower model you had. It could be your any fancy neural network architecture, whatever you have. If you have a way to give me a score between a user and an item, I can use that. At Spotify, at least in this paper in 2017, 18, this was deployed at scale. We use factorization machines. Slight detour at the cost of mixing up a few things. Factorization machines are very, very heavily used. I apologize for not covering it in this lecture because of obvious reasons, like there's a lot to talk about. But oftentimes we need a lot of interaction between features. So I think somebody asked this question in the break that, hey, maybe this video is only relevant at 11 a.m. in the morning, like lullaby music, right? I think like somebody was mentioning that, that like at 11 p.m. you should not be recommending baby lullaby music, maybe at night. Uh, but then how do you know that? You know that because you have a time of the day feature, you have the post performance, you have the user preference. Now you need to have interaction across these features. If you just stack them up in the neural network, it may or may not learn that interaction. So what factorization machines do well is they make sure that the interaction between features are modeled well. So again, it's slightly overburdening. If I were you, I wouldn't remember it. But the moment you hear about factorization machines, think about feature interactions and the need to model that. And then you can read up on that later. Taking a step back, I'm still in the bandit setting, right? I mean, I, I've shown you that I can horizontally create a shelf, rank the shelf vertically to give you homepage. So the first thing I need is a user preference model. It could be any model you have. And based on the context, right? The context could be anything about the user, about time of day, day of the week, uh, what's going on, uh, what your history patterns are, anything. I'll have a training procedure. I can train this model. A yeah, typical training would be like, I look at log data, I train it. Counterfactual training is something you don't know yet. I'm gonna skip that for now. We're gonna touch upon that slightly towards the end. So there's a training procedure. I can train that on historic data. The core is the ranking procedure, right? The ranking procedure is, now that I have these models, how do I start ranking them together? This is what we're gonna spend a bit of time on. Now, again, bandits are a entire tutorial in itself for any conference. So by no means I will do justice covering it, but at least I'll give it a shot and explain something in the next five minutes. Cool, let me see where I can start. So what, what you've seen up until now is that I can pull these slots, I can get a reward, right? So basically, you decided that you're gonna pull the slot machine three, $11, right? And you decided that you're gonna pull a random thing. How did you come back with that decision? You have a action policy, which is giving you a distribution over the actions which you're gonna take. So that's exactly what this model is. I have a set of options. Each of these options is an arm for me, right? I mean, the arms which we pull, right? So essentially the bandit is composed of a set of actions. Action for us on the Spotify homepage is, which playlist do I show to the user? So if I have a thousand playlists, each of these thousand playlists become one, one arm for me. And I have to decide which arm should I pull. In the casino problem we just tackled, you had a brain, you, your brain thought that, oh, actually I have these hundred, I should pick up something, right? So you went in from that action space to the final action. This is what exactly this model is doing. It's kind of giving you the probability of picking up each action. Let's dive into further. So there, there's an, action distribution policy pi. There's a candidate space M. Candidate space for the casino problem was 100, right? I mean, the 100 arms you have. In the Spotify homepage problem, if I have a thousand playlist, each of the thousand playlists become a candidate. I can show that to the user and find out, does the user like it or not? You can pull that arm and find out, did I get $5, $11, $20, what do you get? So this is what's going on. Then I have a reward function. The reward function tells you how much money did you earn? When you pull that slot machine three, you get $11. When you pull that slot machine 51, maybe you get $25, maybe you get $2. You don't know, right? So that reward is something you observe. And then there is this exploration strategy that how much are you gonna go with this guy versus that guy, right? I mean, somebody is like, hey, I'm gonna do zero exploration. So you are out, I'm just gonna exploit. If I keep on, keep on just pulling the third policy, third down. I get $11, $11, $11, I just do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, what happens in the exploration, right? I mean, you don't know that, right? So that, that's exactly what is getting learned here. So there is a, I mean, 
one of the things you can say is like, I'll try a very simple exploration strategy with Italian breeding. That like 95% times I'm gonna exploit what I currently know, but then 5% time I'm just gonna randomly explore. That 5% times, right? If there is a $500 out there, in that exploration, eventually you're gonna hit that, right? With large enough traffic, with large enough users coming onto the platform, you're gonna hit that $500 and then suddenly that becomes part of your exploration, uh, extra, exploitation now, right? So I think eventually with enough randomization, you're gonna get a nice distribution over what the reward vector is for the other arms. And then you can exploit that knowledge. Let me take a step back and distill because I think this is slightly heavy. Look, you have, I mean, you have these slot machines, you get to decide which machine do I pull an arm from and then get the reward. Same for us. In the bandits case on Spotify, I created this, uh, the candidate generator gave me a few thousand. Each of these becomes an arm for me. Now the question is which playlist should I show? And you pull a slot from the, you pull an arm from the slot machine, you get $5 reward. I show a playlist to the user, the user tells me I like it and don't like it. How much stream, how many tracks did you stream? What is the stream time? Uh, what's the total number of songs you played? Did you stay on the platform longer or not, right? So I get a reward every time I pull an arm. So I, you pull an arm, you get $5. I pull an arm, I get like 20, 25 seconds stream time or seven unique tracks stream time. So that's the, that's the setting over here. Bishop, there's a question in the chat. How dynamic behavior is how dynamic behavior is achieved in Spotify for each user? Uh, there's a question from Akash. How dynamic behavior is achieved in Spotify for each user? So I think I mean the dynamicity is again depends on the exploration strategy. If your exploration strategy is on a per user basis or general across, right? So for each user, I'll have the same policy that five percent times I'm going to explore, or I can have a user level policy that hey this user is very narrow. I will explore more or this user is very broad anyway, so I may not explore more about that. So I think you can have a user aware uh, exploration policy here. But assuming that you have this, right? I mean, finally the goal is to learn this policy pie. And then once I have it, this is how you start doing it. If you zoom in, this is what you're doing. You have, you have learned that action policy, you are now gonna sample from it. That now I have this policy, sample a card from this. Once you sample a card, it will give you that playlist, you start showing that. The moment you do that, sample another card and then show that, put it on the right of the previous card and then you create this shelf horizontally. And then you can create a bunch of these shelves. What we are saying now is I'll run another bandit, but now on shelf. Up until now, my action space for the bandit was playlist cards. Now my action space is shelves. And now what I can do is I can sample a playlist, sample a shelf, show that at the top. Sample another shelf, show that in the bottom, at the, like below that, right? And keep on doing that. So this is how, I mean, there's a big difference between this bandit and this one, right? It's, it's a bandit, yes, the action space here is a set of playlists you, uh, playlist you have, and the action space here is a set of cards you have, right? So if you look at the bracket, like the, the pi S, the pi had an M1 in the bracket because the action space was the set of M playlists I have. The, the pi here is the bracket of L1, which is the number of uh, shells we have here. So again, we do that uh, and we test it out. Uh, it kind of gave wins. We deployed it to, back then we had close to 140, 150 million monthly active users. This is 2018-ish. So again, this is a great example of a contextual bandit model in production across 150-ish million users at scale, right? And it's doing that exploration, exploitation. It's learning more about you. It's sometimes showing you random content, understanding whether you like it or not, updating it, and everything is going on online in real-time fashion. So if Today onwards, somebody says that the research in industry and research in academia are very different. People in the industry are just doing some stupid linear models, point them to this paper, point them to the slide. It's not true. I mean, this is five-year-old content, right? Again, bandits, not even this, right? I mean, like Yahoo 2011 bandits on the homepage. So it's, it's a misconception. People have that industry is not advanced enough on the modeling front. Excellent question. I think like this is where there's a lot of like ongoing research and all on this. But there's a very simple way, right? I mean, if you're, the question is, uh, 
Is Spotify, yes, Pinterest has an infinite scroll. So how do I develop a bandit model there, right? I mean, there's nobody stopping you from sampling it again and again, right? If you have a large enough shell space, infinite scroll means that you have infinite shells available, right? So if I'm able to create infinite shells, I can just keep on sampling them time and again and start showing it later on. The, the only change I will make is the context. So these are contextual bandit models, right? I mean, like the things which I slightly didn't go much deeper into that there is a context here, right? Now the context, if you're in a what infinite scroll scenario, right? Then I think you will do a much better job if you are taking into a recent context. When the user started on the homepage, then you didn't have like real time information. But when the user has scrolled twice already, you know what they interacted with in the top five, top 10 shells. Now that should be additional context, which you should bring back to the bandit model. And if that bandit model has that context, then it's gonna do great real time decisioning. If not, then it's not going to do great real-time decisioning. Now it's easy for me to say that I bring it into context, but for that we need like data engineers and system pipelines which are aware of the last 40 seconds, right? Up until the last 40 seconds, what the user is doing, that should be available, that should be featureized, feature transformations happen, go back to the bandit model, add the context, you have that context vector, go to the bandit model, get that inference, get that action distribution, get that card, come back, right? So again, it's very easy for me to say, hey, include that in the context, but then when I actually say it, it has to go through that engineering loop of actually getting it out. And I think one of the problems I'll mention, right? I mean, one of the problems which my uh, team is, one of the Hitesh and Madan and my team are working on is the dynamic ad loads. Like how many ads should I show? And if I show you two ads, maybe it's fine. I mean, you consume it, uh, but then like in a long enough session, right? I know that, oh, you've been responsive and I can adjust based on real time interactions, right? So all of the decisions which I take real time should be aware of the real time context. So I think if you have a contextual bandit model, if you're able to bring in that real time context, then you can make a lot better decisions. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, I'm not qualified to answer that question because I think this is a product take. So I think like we as engineers, scientists, I, I, I mean, we can influence the product direction, but then really, right, it's the product's call. And we, this is the reason why we have product managers, we have product directors, we have the chief product officer, who's kind of, I mean, I mean, I mean that's a high level bureaucratic answer. Uh, the actual answer is, I think we spend a lot of time doing user research, A-B testing, right? The user research, I mean, user research is something which I did not appreciate until Spotify. Like we, Spotify, we literally, we had like, we, we did interviews by, I mean, by we, we mean like in my team, we had a user researcher uh, who had a great like clinical psychology style background and they would kind of bring in people, do the interviews, distill information and then present that insights to us at the team, right? And I think you do large enough, you get that representative view and then you know where to take. Then based on that, you can design some hypotheses, you can try it out. Then the designers comes in, the UX people come in and then once you do that, you spec out some of these things you tried out in a test. The problem then becomes like in an A-B test, in a week-long A-B test, it'll give you some numbers, but then maybe there's a long-term bad impact. So I think then it becomes very, very hard because some of these changes are, it'll change your behavior, right? I mean, look, it's gonna have a huge impact. I mean, I'm glad you brought it up. Like, look, look at what's gonna happen. Look, if, if you have an infinite scroll here, people are gonna go less to search, right? Now the search guy is angry. Right? Hey, I had this traffic, I had to deliver my OKRs. The, the platform level consumption changes now, right? So again, like, and I mean, look, imagine, right? I mean, I'm just trying to extrapolate that. If Swiggy does that, then the, the food getting ordered in Ahmedabad changes because you decided to have a bandit which is doing infinite scroll, right? The, the, the people earning the money on these things, right? The societal level impact of a minor change, right? Why? Because suddenly people are not going to that tab anymore. One of the other things, if you go to Instagram, right? Even on, on share chat, you have this explore tab on, you have the feed, you have the explore, which gives you like people you don't follow. Now, if the feed suddenly starts doing a lot of diversity, you, you, I think you, you brought this up, like diversity, right? If we on the feed start doing more diversity, people don't see a need to go to that tab, right? Now those models, this is how, this is funny, but it's actually true. I mean, not in my product. I mean, I'm not saying it is true or not, but look, there's gonna be business strategy goals, right? I have to deliver X exposure to X publishers, to X content creators. 
where is that implemented? Maybe that's implemented on the home page or maybe on the export page. So some stakeholder somewhere is relying on traffic on that tab. Now your experiment changed the consumption behavior. So that person is not getting enough traffic. So that stakeholder is not making enough money. So maybe it's a net gain for you on the home team, but the company is bleeding money because of this change, right? So very, very feasible, very, very possible. And imagine at Spotify, right? Again, I'm not saying this happens or doesn't happen, but there's a very likely scenario that you start showing good music, podcast consumption goes down, right? This cannibalization happening across content. I mean, you, you show something, something else goes down. Now podcast is free content, right? I mean, music, there is a deal. I have to pay a label 50 cents on a dollar when I recommend that content, right? On podcast, I don't have to make play that money. Right? Netflix originals, all of that same problem. Like I, Netflix has to pay Disney X amount of money for each video play. For Netflix originals, it doesn't. So the moment there is a content distribution change, the entire platform economics changes, right? Now the question becomes, do you have data scientists, evaluation people who are as mindful of the impact which any of this change is gonna have, right? Now, who in the audience would care to take that job, right? Have you been exposed to these problems? No, you haven't. The only evaluation you've done is accuracy, right? At best, NDCG. Like, I mean, the platform level evaluation, th this is like economic policy playing out in the world, right? I mean, this is what, like, I mean, the Delhi government is spending, I'm going way beyond my expertise here, but the Delhi government is spending way too much money, I mean, good money on go building good government schools means the, prim the, the private school ecosystem, the economics over there change, right? So again, at the platform, at the society level, you have a policy, you enact that policy, it's gonna have a first order, second order, third order effect. And on the evaluation side, we need people to measure that second order, third order effect, and then come back with an economics of the platform. So in the first slide, I'm gonna come back to that. In the first slide, when I said that, hey, platform economics is important and people don't realize and appreciate it, right? I really mean it. The platform economics over here, like diversity is a great example. We change, I'm gonna do that at the risk of getting fired. Uh, It's fine. There is a bunch of categories. There's red and green here, right? That's it. I'm gonna come back and use that. Look, what we did was there's devotion and some of these categories are heavily popular on, the, on our platform. Like astrology, some other politics categories, not so much popular. We added this diversity layer about the month back on share chat. Suddenly we are able to take away from the rich categories, give it to the poor categories, right? Niche categories. Now users who love those niche categories, they were not getting that recommendation. Now they are getting that recommendation. So retention increased. So users are happier. Right? The content distribution on our platform is entirely different now than it is just in last month, month, right? But then do we have enough capability to measure the long-term impact of that? I'm sorry, I mean, even right now, I don't, right? I mean, like, what's the long-term implication of it? Is it healthy? Is it good for my platform or not? I don't know. So I think like we need good, good ways to kind of quantify and evaluate a bunch of that. Other question? I mean, same, I mean, you might as, as well not ask this question if you, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's good. I mean, in one way, but there is like strategic behavior. I mean, look on search, there is a, there's a prediction, right? I mean, generally people search for this. So this content gets enough traffic from search. Now people are searching less, that content is not getting that traffic. So the stakeholders who's relying on that traffic is kind of getting hurt. So there are these second order effects over there. No, even the search, right? What people search for is gonna be different. So, I mean, they, if you search for it, then maybe like you search for relaxing music, in relaxing music, I would have had a chance to expose a tail artist, but tail artists are not getting surface on the homepage. So now suddenly the tail artists on the platform are not getting enough exposure. So I think like the moment you change the user behavior and look, I mean, each of this is talking about like hundreds of millions of users doing it, right? So hundreds of millions of users doing it in a month and even a 2% change in consumption behavior there has a economic impact on the rest of the content.
Okay. Right. Look, yes, I mean, and, and put it on Square, right? Do it on the Excel stream. If you look at the Explore tab on Instagram, it's not even doing horizontal scrolling, horizontal vertical. It's saying like the sizes are different. I mean, if you look at the Instagram Explore, right? There is a video which is like slightly more vertical. There's a couple of images there, right? I mean, people have done whole page optimization on, I mean, you can even customize the number of elements, right? Why, why stop at that? This is fixed, right? Like intelligent UI design. If you look at a bunch of IUI papers, like there's an ACM conference on that. And they are talking about, hey, I mean, the interface should be malleable and different users have different needs and based on the intent, based on the users, like change the UI, right? And Instagram Explore tab is an example of that. Like some of the images, some of the videos get a bigger rectangle, vertical box. Some of these images and videos get other design, other rectangular boxes. So the size is not fixed, right? So I think what you're talking about makes sense. And like Instagram on the Explore tab have done something like that. I don't know if it's like fixed or there's a template or it's like automatically learned or something, but I mean, that UI does exist. Yes. Yeah, that, that, I, I think that's a great question. I think like, I mean, not the UI, but the recommendation should. I think then it, it, it depends like whether the feature engineers on the home team have exploited search queries as a possible uh, user. I mean, it could be a different place, right? The user embedding could be informed by search, right? Which I mean, search is a very explicit signal. It's a very strong signal, right? So I think like, I think like teams at Spotify are using it, but do we generally do that across the industry? We should, but some teams are very cognizant, some are not. And I think like search could also just inform your trend, trending behavior, right? So a lot, I mean, maybe on YouTube, you get a lot of these videos on, 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 on Instagram, you don't. So maybe people start searching and they end up not consuming it. So search is a great dissatisfaction tool as well. So identifying the trends, like what content people want, but they're not getting on the feed. If you have to search for something, that means the home screwed up, right? So I think like that feedback loop across touch points is important. And again, it's a very English statement for me to make, right? That, hey, it's a, uh, it's a feedback loop. But then like, to be honest, like these are even problems. Like how do you, if you, if I give you a search history and you have, you have this, you have the user representation there here, right? Now you, you have this user representation and now you have a bunch of search history. Now you'll have to develop a neural architecture to bring in that history, add that feature and then pass it on in that network as well, right? So again, each of my English sentences, I don't want you to just take the impression that, hey, there's a product manager talking just about like English statements, let's do that. But behind each of these, there is a model architecture change which we need to think about. So I'm kind of, Yes, yes, high, high, high intent. Yeah, search is very, very high intent. If you're searching for something, I think that, that's a very good point. Uh, one of the things which, if you zoom in one of, in one of the papers, right, we have mentioned that, hey, uh, some of these signals, are like add to a playlist, right? Add to a playlist is a very strong signal. I mean, a stream of a song, you may just be like not listening, right? I mean, so somebody has a headphone on, they've left the headphone, there's like 10 music songs playing, and they're not skipping, right? So I think escapes and streams are very, very omnipresent, but very less informative, but a downstream or a add to playlist is like highly informative, but very rare, right? So we had, a, actually we had a paper at KDD 2020, which is looking at learning from weak supervision. So, I mean, you, you, sometimes you have a lot of data, but the strength of the signal is very less. Sometimes you have less data, but the strength of the signal is very large. So how do you learn from some of this mixed supervision data? Yes, and how, how does your ML model pick up, pick up on that, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not just gonna ignore this strong data because it's less, and I'm not gonna, I mean, let the large data which is weak overpower this, right? So how do you fine tune? How do you give enough importance in your training, in your learning, even in your SGD, right? I mean, in this, I mean, if you really want to zoom in, like in the, a lot of these like SGDs and Adam are momentum based. So what we said was like, when you're learning uh, in the SGD, like you have a momentum term in the Adam, then, I mean, I won't allow any of the weaker examples to change my momentum drastically. So then I'll make sure that like only local changes in the gradient direction are allowed by the weak, weak examples and the large enough changes are only allowed by the strong examples, right? Again, very, very English view of looking at it, but then there are like a few papers and we have we've written one at KDD on that. Yep. And can you just get rid of sir, please? I mean, I, I, I don't think, it's 2022, I don't think people use that set anymore. Yeah.
inherently yes inherently yes 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 absolutely yeah i think for new users by definition is everything is going to be exploratory because we know nothing about them uh, but then this is where like in session personalization kicks in and hopefully like uh, yeah, any signal from you is like great value add so we're going to do more on that too cool I, I, your question just scared me, right? It's like, hey, we've been talking about recommendations for three hours and like, hey, how does it work? Sorry, go ahead. Yes, 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 yes. So uh, great, great point. I, I have a couple of slides on this later. One of the short answers is what's optimal for you is not optimal for him, right? Because like some users want discovery, some don't. Some users are okay with exploration, exploitation, some are don't, right? So some people have narrow consumption horizon, they're okay with it, some are broad and they're not okay with it. So I think like it's a very personalized choice. This is why the exploration policy could be intelligent. And again, it's not just intelligent for the user, right? I mean, I as a platform have a need. I mean, I would rather prefer you discover new content because as a marketplace, I can show other creators to you. If you just stick with what you want, then you're very less used to me, right? This other user, she's very interested. Like whatever I recommend to her, she develops a taste. Great, I love that user. Why? Because I can recommend tail creators, stick mark my ads, all the other metrics, right? You as a user are very stubborn in your habits. You don't like what I knew discovery content, right? So then, I mean, all for the user, there is one side, which is like, let's respect what we want. But then as a platform, like I do want to make sure that enough users are discovering and going meta, right? Can I increase the discovery appetite for you? I won't give up on you. I know you don't like it, but then like maybe I'll keep trying that. Can I expand your taste? Can I make you want discovery? You don't want discovery right now, but then can I make you want more of it, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, great question. I think this is when like, I mean, like, we should look at the session level, like set level metrics, right? That, hey, what's the composition of familiar music, discovery music? Is it overpowered by discovery? Is it underpowered by this? And uh, I think like this is also going to reflect in the engagement behavior, right? If, I mean, suddenly if the users are abandoning the session, right? Then that means like, hey, you, you, you did something wrong. I think like in one and a half hours, I'm going to come back to you with two slides and I'm going to remember that. Hopefully you can stay around. If not, then I'll point in that direction. Somebody was asking that question there. Uh, cool. I think one of the one of the nice things to mention here, right? I mean, there's a reward signal, and the reward signal, like right now for you, was dollars. Here is like playtime. So one of the little reward signals to have is if you stream for more than thirty seconds, great, uh, love it. It's a plus one. If you don't stream for thirty seconds, right? It's it's a zero. So we're close to noon. So I'm going to bring the mic up. So amp up the volume. People are sleeping. If if they are, I'm not saying you are. But yeah, so essentially what's going on is that uh, we can train on a binary reward signal. Now, if you consume a playlist for more than 30 seconds, I mean, 30 seconds is just a number. Great, plus one, if not zero, right? That's a reward signal. Where is the reward used? Reward is used in this bandit setup here. There's a reward model here. Reward for you was $11, for you was something else. Now, the question then becomes, is a very intuitive, that we did some work that, hey, this sucks. Why have a global reward function, right? Sleep music. People will consume sleep music for far longer. Like some, and so the 30 second threshold is bad. So we had a paper at the web conference in 2019. Uh, Paulo was an intern with us. He then went on to Critio. Now he's at Twitter. Uh, how do we develop these uh, more user and content aware reward functions? So the question then is like, if you look at variations, then uh, generally aggregate over playlist, this is a distribution of stream time. On sleep music is much longer, right? As expected. Like I want people to fall asleep with sleep music. So again, like 30 seconds sucks. Two hours, yes, maybe great. But same across users, right? I mean, jazz listeners consume jazz music and other playlists far longer than average. So there is user level variation, there is content level variation. Now we should have a distribution based reward, right? Why have a global reward? So this, the thing which we have seen up until now is a global reward. All users, all content, same function. Ideally, we'd want each user, each content, a reward, right? But then the problem is it's too granular, too sparse, and very costly to generate and very costly to maintain. Imagine like 400 million users, 100 million content. This is the space of functions you're maintaining, not feasible. So then you could do some co-clustering, right? This is the only time I'm going to mention clustering because clustering to me is a 
15 year old problem and if i mention that then i'm not state of the art uh, but i think like co clustering what you can do is you can have users and playlist you've seen that in a matrix factorization world here you can co cluster them together so there are groups of users groups of playlist based on based on the value of the matrix the value of the matrix here is how much is the consumption time right so you can have a uh, mutual information minimization based grouping uh, and get some co clusters it's again theoretically it's easy but co clustering at the scale is hard uh, and uh, i mean there are challenges in there are papers on it the the good part about this is now that i have, when i co cluster i can look at the local distribution i can look at the local distribution of users and content and then within that i can make my own reward definition right and that's what we did we said that hey instead of a global one do the co clustering look at the local consumption patterns and then define a reward now you have a much better reward signal you can train your bandwidth and it gives you better gains cool so again uh, what's going on i think like we are okay on time and i think uh, but yeah so we've looked at candidate generator we've looked at rankers i've talked about multitask ranking i talked about hey we want to do explore exploit we talked about a bandwidth we've talked about reward modeling if you look at a bunch of iclr iclr is a great uh, deep learning conference if you look at a bunch of iclr papers a lot of papers coming up now are reward shaping how do we learn these reward function because look i mean reward is exactly what i mean you you train a pet dog i'm sorry i'm comparing pet dogs to machine learning models i was about to do that with humans but you train a pet dog you give it a reward it's kind of i mean rewards shape the behavior right essentially same for kids right i mean like you you steal your parents shout at you hopefully not beat you and then you learn from that so essentially reward is how the model learns right so reward formulation reward function definition is exactly what the model is incentivized to maximize so i think there is a great nuance to mention here i don't have a slide for that is the distinction between prediction problems and reward maximization problems and if you are doing machine learning right then i think like you should spend time at your home in your college thinking about the difference here some of these problems are prediction problems what is the probability of you liking content and i can train a prediction model i can make it better i can have better accuracy is better precision great but what do i do with it most of the problems are reward maximization problems right i want a longer time frame i want more money i want more session length right so the reward formulation problem is not a prediction problem look i mean google pay i'll give you an example it's worth the 5 minute detour i promise uh look at google play right i mean we we interviewed somebody an amazing problem sir uh, google pay or paytm whatever it gives you some cashbacks so it says that hey i mean you you make a payment with us and i'm going to give you 20% cashback right with 20% everybody is going to do that but then you're bleeding money right you're losing 20% of the transaction fees so then with some for some user i'm going to give 5% right but then the question is hey at 5% this user made a transaction the other user didn't right so then maybe i should have done a 7% i did a 15% i gave 15% they came back they they did the transaction now the question here is is 15% enough would they have done the transaction at even 13% 10% 8% how much extra money am i uselessly wasting here now i'll give you 100 pounds right now if you can solve it via prediction problem develop a prediction model any neural network any architecture any laws and solve this problem it cannot be solved i mean long story short why because this is not a prediction problem it's a reward maximization problem it's not even a reward maximization problem it's a trade off handling problem i want to increase the chances of user doing a transaction while making sure that the amount of money i'm losing via the rebate is minimized right so it's a trade off problem it cannot be solved via a prediction task so this is where bandwidths and these reward maximization and the reward is a trade off right how do you design a reward for that hey i am i want to maximize this while minimizing this it could be a constraint optimization problem sure or it could just be a weighted sum of rewards wherein like you do more discounts you lose out on the reward why because you're bleeding money or if you reduce the discount you lose out on people because they are not it's not attractive offer enough a lot of these problems are solved using this reward function definition and this is a trade off right i mean the entire work which i've been doing for the last 3 4 years and i hopefully continue to do that uh until until i get fired is going to be on uh on these reward maximization trade off problems right so 
I would love for you to explain what you mean by off policy and on policy because these are very very relevant terms. Off policy valuation is a entire field, and if you know what you're talking about, then I think we should talk. Yes, so I think like the great question. I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't think I have, I have a good scientific answer to that. So the question is like, I mean, yeah, I don't think we should do a generic thing forever, right? I think this should be guided by two factors. I mean, at least two factors. One is globally, right? I mean, how global, I mean, how, how much of an exploration budget do you have entirely, right? Because each time you, do some randomization, right? You're going to lose some user satisfaction. So there's going to be some guardrail budget to that. And then on the user front as well. I mean, if you have, let's say, Thompson sampling or some other strategy, right? It's going to minimize the uncertainty. So then maybe I am very certain. I know your preferences. So then I'm not going to prioritize you for that exploration. Somebody else I know very little about. So maybe I'm going to do that exploration on them, right? So you can kind of do that resource allocation across. But do people do that at companies? This is something which I, at least I personally haven't seen that. It makes sense to do it, but then it makes, so it kind of assumes that, hey, you have a bandit model, you have enough people, now you want to go in for the next level of gains, which is intelligent exploration design, right? Which is a great problem. There's a few papers on this. James from Netflix, here, that's Spotify, he might have been doing at Netflix. I don't know what he's doing right now, but at least like I'm not aware of us doing it yet. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you can design the trade-off in the exploration stage as well, yes. Right. Great, love it. I think like, look, I mean, you make a prediction and then you have uncertainty, right? You still have to use that uncertainty to make a decision. Right? So suddenly it's not a prediction problem, right? Because, I mean, there is, I mean, what do you do with that uncertainty? Do you have a lower bound, upper bound? You're going to have to do something with it. So it's not a prediction problem anymore, right? You make a prediction, you use that prediction in some policy decision and then make that decision, right? Yes. So, I mean, that, that layer is not, a, the final decision maker is not a prediction model, right? So that, that's the difference between like prediction and decision making. And I think like a lot of the, typical machine learning we read about is just predictions, whereas a lot of the things which we actually deploy are decisions, right? And I think like there is a reason why I, I, want to, I want to automate that, right? Because look, I mean, if the user is not happy, right? Then is this the prediction model is wrong? Is it my way of combining it, making the decision wrong? What do I innovate, right? And again, I make changes here, I make changes here, how do I tease apart, all that is messy. So then ideally, like if we have an end-to-end -end model to do that, then I can just at least learn it incrementally do better, right? So again, it's easy for me to say this. We're still working on it. I think there would be a few solutions out. But bandits are a way out. Trade-off, yeah, I mean like, I meant like reward maximization in the sense, yeah, so the reward is multi-objective. Like you get plus points for bringing a user, you lose points for like bleeding money. Negative set, yes, yes. So, but, Okay, cool, yeah. I think we're gonna hit at one and then wrap up. 15, 15 minutes is fine. Oh, we were supposed to have lunch at 12.30, is it? Oh, okay, cool. But then are there like some mess criteria or something? Oh, okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna go for max 15 more minutes and then like wrap up uh, in the next. I'm gonna come back to that in 15 minutes. Sorry. Cool, I think like we're, we're close to the end of it, uh, or at least this first part. And I think like this is where I'm gonna slightly rush. But I mean, overall, right? You start seeing even the Google Play, Play example, we see the trade-off, right? That you gain some, you lose some. Let's kind of put it on steroids and do it max, right? How do you balance even more for the objectives? Here you care about all the stakeholders we have over here, including the platform economics. Now I'll give you an example. Like you, you put out a few, on the right, you have these heat map across correlation across objectives, right? And then you start seeing that user satisfaction diversity across suppliers, promotion, right? Now satisfaction, every satisfaction metrics like clicks, stream times, item consumed, they're all correlated. 
So that means like you optimize for one, you get the other for free. So you benefit, right? I mean, you don't have to optimize for all three of them. You do one and the others tag along. Supplier diversity is slightly neutral. So, I mean, I don't get it for free. If I care about supply diversity or supply fairness, I'll have to optimize for it explicitly. If I start promoting certain content, strategy content, like it could be like female artists or black history man going on, uh, artists from that community or anything, right? That gives me some negative correlation. So that means like I'll have to optimize and balance, right? And if I start promoting more, my satisfaction tanks. So there's a trade-off world. Now in this trade-off world, right? How do we balance it? So we have a few ways of doing it. Uh, we have a contextual bandit, which is a KDD paper we had. We had my first single author paper, which I'm very proud of, uh, which is the, no, we're not gonna talk about this today, but we had a paper at Sikkim last year. Uh, this is currently deployed at Spotify. If you use any of your playlists, right? The playlist have uh, the, the model from the right in production right now. I mean, at least in January, I know unofficially it hasn't been removed since I left. Uh, so that's currently in production. But essentially, we can, I mean, there are a few ways of doing it. You can do it in a typical neural network way, or you can do it in a contextual bandit way, right? Now, because we have some bandit history right now, I'm going to focus more on the first part, right? And the second part we can discuss later, or uh, you can look at the paper or some YouTube video on, on it as well. Now, you've, you've seen that contextual bandit model, right? Typically, there's a action policy. You have these arm selection criteria. Now, the only change I want to make here is make it multi-objective. I have a function, that function was single objective up until now. Now, what I want to do is make it multi-objective. I think like I'm gonna skip the details. I'm just gonna give you the math intuition behind it. That function proposal from our side is use this GGA function, generalized Gini function. And it's a special form of OWA, ordered weighted average. It prefers allocations that are more equitable. A lot of fancy words, right? And very simple function. Like Gini index is used since 100 plus years for uh, econ economic disparity. Right? I mean, rich versus poor and all that, right? Now let me show how we, we wanted to use it. Now, GGF is a, again, long story short is you have the same bandit setting. There's a single objective function. You swap out the single objective, put in this multi-objective and things should work. Now, what exactly is the beauty of this math function? So we're gonna spend five minutes on this function and then wrap up. So GGF is a special form of OWA. OWA is ordered weighted average. Now, what essentially happens is you're not, in a typical weighted sum, right? You have W1, S1 plus W2, S2. Look, I'll give a disclaimer. It's a complete refresh. If you haven't been paying attention for the last five hours, five days, I don't care. If you just wake up right now, you can get on board the strain. You can understand this math and use it anywhere. It has nothing to do with recommendations. It's just a nice, beautiful mathematical function, which will give you some value. So people online, people in the room, if you've been sleeping, let's wake up, focus on this. Let's start afresh, right? I will do a weighted sum. A weighted sum gives me a W1, S1 plus W2, S2, right? So far with me. Now the W1 is assigned to S1, fixed, right? Every time S1 gets a W1, wait. Here I'm saying, no, 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 I don't want that. I'll give the weights to the sorted values. It's not that S1 gets the W1. What I'm gonna do is I am gonna sort the scores and then the highest score gets the weight W1. The second highest gets W2, the last highest gets W3, right? Now, essentially what this means is that it's not a fixed scoring anymore. I'm not assigning weights to attributes. Instead, I'm assigning to currently how something is, right? If something is really good, I can assign a weight to W1 to it. So again, it's very dynamic, it's not fixed. I'm gonna use that in a bit. Now, again, controlling this allows me dynamic control, dynamic importance to attributes. Suddenly this intuition will pop up in your brain in two minutes. Now this is where like there's something called pigeon delta transfer. It prefers allocations that are more equitable. I'll, I'll mention what this means. So there's some, ni some nice work in the early 1900s on pigeon delta transfer that says that a gap diminishing transfer from somebody with more to somebody with less decreases inequality. I mean, it's an English statement, right? There is inequality in the system. You take in something from the rich, give it to the poor, the inequality decreases, right? Now, this is exactly how it happens here. I care about three objectives. This is how they're performing right now. The third objective is doing really well, right? I'm making a lot of money, but my users are unhappy. Or my users are happy, I'm not enough on creator objective, whatever. What if I take something from the rich, give it to the poor, right? I, again, I know that objective three is good. I can reduce that. I can give some importance to objective two. And then this will give me this world. And this world is more equitable, right? So this function, if you optimize for GGF function, this is what happens. 
Now you've heard of Pareto optimality. Pareto optimality is talks about efficiency, right? Pareto efficient means that, okay, this is a trade-off curve. I cannot do better on this objective without hurting the other objective. So Pareto optimality talks about efficiency. Pareto optimality cares about equity, right? If you optimize this function, you get a more equitable distribution. And my final punch over here is that let's, let's apply that across the multiple objectives I had. In the contextual mandate model, I had a single reward function because it's a single objective function. Now I have a multi-objective contextual bandit model. I have multiple rewards. So each stakeholder gets a column here. Now dynamically, I'll keep on looking at how are you doing? If you're doing really well, then I can reduce the importance I give to you and then focus on the other objectives which are not doing well. So essentially, essentially what happens is it prefers allocations that are more equitable. So here is an example. Assume that I have X, right? X, I, J and all other values are the different objectives I have. Now, if xj is bigger than xi, right? So I'm doing well on xj. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reduce something from xj. So that means like x minus ej, right? And I'm gonna give it to the ith objective. Now, this value of this function, gw on the right is better than gw on the left. So this is exactly what I was talking about here, right? That in a world wherein you have something on the left, this is more equitable, That's, that will get a higher value than the plot on the right. So again, this is just a mathematical way of saying this, that if you have this function, which if you do this, right, for all xj, which is greater than xi, if I remove something from xj, give it to xi, it's gonna increase the value of this function itself. No, no, I mean, I mean, at the current ranking, the moment you distribute that, then you recompute it, right? So then xj may not be, yeah, yeah. Yeah, only the SL, yes, yes. Yeah, that's great, yes, yeah. So as long as like, you know, I mean, as long as you're not suddenly making it poor and then like making the other person rich, yeah. I think that's a great point. We should mention that there's a cap on the epsilon on the delta. Yeah, that's great to mention. I mean, actually it's there, right? I mean, like yeah. for all epsilon between uh, XA, XA minus A, yeah. So I think, yeah, so this is exactly what this is doing. It's preferring a transfer from somebody with more to somebody with less, it will decrease inequality. Now, the goal here is to balance the reward vector. Like I have multiple of objectives, each objective gets a reward and it can now try to, if one of the objectives is getting a high reward, the other is getting a low reward, it can dynamically balance it based on where we are. So it's kind of a measure of balancedness. Now, how do you solve it? Like this mat is great. Now you can, I mean, okay, what is this function? How do you solve it? This is where actually the rubber hits the road. Now the GGF of a vector can be optimally solved via solving this linear program. So again, you don't have to take my word for it. I mean, you actually, you have to take my word for it. Uh, there's no way out. Essentially, you can solve it via linear program solutions, right? And you can, you can again, this is, I mean, this is nothing we did. There's already a solution. This is nothing new, 10, 20, 30 year old uh, optimization solutions here. The problem is this doesn't scale well. So computationally, this is expensive for real world deployment. So what we did was we just proposed a gradient based solution to this. And again, I'm gonna skip the details. Look, if you care about, this is very independent, right? If you don't know anything about machine learning, you can still look at, you can look at what a linear program is. You can look at how linear programs have solvers of their own. So in the industry, I don't have to recreate it. As long as I can formulate the objective in a linear programmable solution, I can use solvers to solve this problem for me. But the question is like, it's, it's expensive, so I can use a gradient based strategy. That's what we did. I'm gonna skip the details. This is the contextual bandit solution, right? The, the math heavy slide. Uh, skipping the details, focusing on the objective here. Hand wavily, literally hand wavily, you look at there's an arm selection strategy, which is based on, hey, give me a distribution based on which a recommendation is selected. So a few slides ago, we were talking, oh, I have these playlists, I have these arms, which one should I pick? That's what the outcome is. Each time a user comes in, I have a round, I have a set of contextual features, this is a the context. Then I observe a linear reward, but because, Again, it's a multi-objective world, then it's not a scalar reward. I have a vector full of rewards. Now, since I don't know what the reward is because, I mean, everything is context dependent, right? I don't know. There is a key thing which I'm not explaining here and I cannot afford to, which is the $11 you got, right? It's not fixed. I'm sorry to break the news to you, but essentially what happens is there is a distribution on that vector itself. Why? Because today morning you like that playlist, just in the evening, you may not like it, right? So the reward I get from pulling that arm for you is context dependent. 
So that $11 which you got was distribution as well. So sometimes based on context, you will get 11, sometimes you'll get 12, sometimes you'll get nine. So this is why I have to learn it. Again, I don't think I can afford to explain that in detail, but there is some learning involved. The only thing which I think like we should focus on, given the context of today's discussion, is the function which I had before was a single objective function. Now what I've done is replace that by this multi-objective function. What is the multi-objective function? This is exactly this function we've been talking about, this GGF here. So let's stitch it, stitch it all together, right? And like wrap up in another minute, which is, look, we have the bandit model, which is doing this exploration, exploitation, the single objective, it has a reward function, the reward is stupid, we made it user and like content aware based on co-clustering, all that great. It's still a single objective function. Then we said, oh, I care about multiple objectives. I want to make some balance in this. Oh, then we said, hey, you know what? There is a great economics literature, GGF, GGI functions are great. Then we looked at some properties. Oh, actually this is nice because it reduces inequality and it does some dynamic reallocation. Great, and uh, I can solve it, right? I can solve it using this program. It doesn't work, so then I'll solve it using some deep learning methods, great. Once I have all of this, then what I'll do is go back to my contextual bandit, say that, hey, you single objective function, I'm gonna take you out, swap you with this function. Why? Because I now know this function works really well and do that. So all in all, you're swapping out the single objective function, putting in the GGF multi-objective variant, and then magic happens, right? I mean, it performs much better and uh, it gives you gains for uh, business goals and like everything else. Last two seconds on this. Look, even if you are not a marketplace, right? You don't care about drivers, you don't care about anything. If you just care about users, then also there is value in becoming multi-objective. So just optimizing for multiple user satisfaction objectives is better than optimizing for single objective. Why? Because some of these metrics have a chaining effect. You have to have a click in order to have a 30 second stream. You have to have 30 second streams in order to have a five minute long session. You have to have multiple five minutes long session in order to have a longer session, right? So essentially there is chaining effect. There is a structural relation between these objectives. So a multi-objective model will allow you to benefit and learn from that. So even if you're not marketplace, my, my goal is that, hey, my argument is treat your problem as a multi-objective problem. This is what we did. Like, I mean, I wasn't given the, again, this is recorded. I won't say it, but essentially like, I mean, we initially were not trying it out on artist goals. We tried it on user goals. We got some gains and then we expanded it to artist goals and it kind of worked better. And that's what we show here, right? Like optimizing for multiple interaction metrics performs e better on each metric than directly optimizing that metric. And later on, this was one of the biggest learnings we've had, right? In my career at Spotify, this changed the headcount allocation for next year, like in a big way. We were able to show that this is not a zero sum game you can gain in your business goals without hurting users, right? Now, this is a very, very bold, very, very strong statement to make. So that's why there's a can within across the piece here, right? I mean, it's not, again, depending on what the solution is, what the problem domain is, but often people think that, hey, I'm gonna gain in creators and my suppliers, I'm gonna hurt my users. That's not true. This is the reason why the entire area of marketplace should exist. This is the reason why I've given like numerous tutorials on this topic and I keep mentioning this again. If you look at what Flipkart, Amazon, all these companies are doing, right? They are, they're, they're not formulating the problem as a multi-objective solution, right? So if anybody is listening to me, right? I chime in again, you'll see me talk about exactly this. One of the reasons I joined ShareChat was also that, hey, in the industry, we should formulate these recommendation problems as multi-objective formulations because you can get win-win scenarios. It need not be a zero-sum game, right? Right now, a lot of, it's very easy for us to, we, we have a 20 year history of formulating problems as a user-centric problem. Why? Because Google search started, Google started that page rank, the entire, the entire industry is focused on single objective users. All the metrics, all the, all the evaluation, user engagement, metrics, experimentation, everything is user-centric. So we've had a lot of baggage in the industry on deploying these problems as, formulating these problems as single objective and the overall pitch is, hey, it's not a zero sum game. Not necessarily, but often it's not. So that's it, right? I mean, like this is the end of it. We talked about traditional recommendations, multi, multi, multi-stage pipelines, candidate generators. We started looking at rankers like multitask learning models, bandit based solutions. And then we touched upon multi-objective machine learning for marketplace. So that's what we have covered. Uh, we've covered a lot and thank you for at least staying back and not walking out of the room. Uh, we're gonna, the next, this was slightly heavy, right? Uh, when we come back, we're gonna talk about some light material. Uh, 
and wrap it all up. Cool. Thank you.